Well, welcome everybody to uh, just a, a follow-up call for for Think Next. Um, John uh, really kind of pushed us and, and kind of encouraged us while we were together. Like, what are what are you guys doing to to help implement and help encourage guys to to move forward a lot with a lot of this content? And uh, so many times at Think Next, we've just got overwhelmed with a, just a ton of incredible information. Um, but there's really no, not a lot of intentional follow up on the back end of it, other than just kind of individual coaching and stuff like that. And so just wanted to facilitate a, a conversation today around um, all the, the stuff that we talked about at Think Next. So our, our heart's desire for, for 2022 was to really instill um, a passion and a desire and to help train and equip a lot of our church planters to raise up leaders from the harvest for the harvest uh, to send out to the harvest right and so um, a lot of times that we've we've been incredibly blessed at nexus over the years to be well resourced and well funded and the main problem with our network and so many other networks has been you know we have resources for church plants we just don't have a lot of church planters ready to go out and occasionally we'll get guys that reach out to us from all sorts of different locations and venues but our um you know last year we realized you know really just started turning towards the fact that man we really need to look into just the hearts of our churches and and raise up leaders and intentionally disciple leaders not that they'd be ready to go out and plant a church like this fall possibly that's the case but maybe three falls from now if we were very intentional about investing in leaders and developing other guys to be able to get to a point where we are um, crafting and molding and shaping a culture of leadership development that results in church planters. And obviously that looks like a ton of different things, you know, from the traditional church planting models to bivocational church planting models to house church models and everywhere in between, but just having a core foundation of understanding the gospel, obviously through all of the heartbeat of what the Bonhoeffer Project does, understanding understanding what disciples are, understanding how we go about training multiplicative disciple making based disciple making based on you know principle based obedience um discipleship training rather than just information dumping and so uh, super excited for what think next was where we invited in uh, mac lake to do a lot of leadership development training we we were incredibly blessed to have josh howard there uh just by god's divine providence just being able to be in not only the country but in our little neck of the woods during that uh, that week and so so that was super exciting and very convicting, um, <laughs> especially just hearing from him and all of these ridiculous stories of church planting with all these biblical numbers that just seem unfathomable. But I really loved his challenge to, you know, um, you know, that's well, that's India. It can't really happen here. Or that's Myanmar. It can't really happen here. Or that's Africa. But God's just like. No, I love people everywhere, and he just really challenged us with that. So I'd love to, uh, you know, be John, just kind of hear from you of what um, kind of your takeaway was from from some of the primary content that we deliver, and then just, you know, help to ask questions and just kind of hear back from from everybody on the call, like what were some of those main things that stood out to you guys? But John, what was what was it for you that stood out for you? Um, well, I, I, I enjoyed all, all of what's going on, you know, and I just, I had like, I, I I wrote down just uh, the three speakers. So, you know, just remembering just day one, Phil talked about developing just um, our, our fostering our spirituality, right? On um, That was his take first thing. And my, my takeaway, the gem that I got was Psalm 110, verse three, about just trust in the Lord. And that part of being his kid, his leader is that verse three, right? Your troops will be willing. Young men will come to me as a free will offering. And that was really reinforcing. And secondly, from Phil, I also got the idea of it's, it's, we're, we're never too far along in our Christianity to foster and, and strengthen our spiritual disciplines. And um, um, so that was just a high point. Um, from Mac, I think that um, um, the biggest thing I got was when he, he, he talked a quote about coming from a little country church. Remember the story told about being the kid, shy kid walking down the street and put his head down when the girl would walk forward and he's a middle schooler. And, um, and what I appreciated, a lot of gems from Mac, but I think that, that he, he, he really highlighted the idea that, um, about spiritual transformation. You know, and that a transforms a transformed leader will produce transformed leaders, and so that was a, that was a kind of a big hook for me when I was listening to him because you hear a lot of guys talk about leadership, but this guy just coming from a place where God transformed him, 
And then God began to grab him in the process. And, and so he leads transformationally. And I think that, and then the second thing, which really grabbed me in light of what you just said, Andrew, too, is that he he's showing us a pipeline, not the pipeline, but a possible pipeline where we can begin to create a farm system for those potential church planters that can, how do we develop? We recognize guys and and from the personal lead to, to, to leading a team, to leading leaders, and, and then we as senior leaders, how do we create the structure by which our guys can blossom and go out there and do greater things, you know, and plant churches. And even um, in the notes, just the several models, I think towards the end of it, he, he, he mentioned um, different types of ways to, to plant churches, right? That there's um, the, the house church, um, cell church network, the launch large, the missional incarnational satellite campus, blah, blah, blah. You know, he, he talked about five ways to do that. And then from Josh Howard, I guess um, it's, yeah, I, you know, his three things. I just loved it. Um, pray big, hairy, audacious prayers. Um, have a heart that says yes to God before he answers the question. Your heart's already said yes. And dream God-sized dreams. So, um, and so that was, those are some of my takeaways from it. And, um, you know, later on as we're doing this, one of the reasons I was talking to Andrew and Phil about this is that, when a lot of times when, when, when I was younger, I'd go to conferences and all of a sudden I come back and I'd, I'd have the new great idea for my church. Hey, I got a new idea. God spoke to me. And, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm leading this church that is an aircraft carrier, but I'm, I'm leading it. Like it's a, like it's a sailboat and I'm tacking and doing this and doing this stuff. So every conference, my church council would hold on and say, Oh my gosh, what's he going to do now? And I'd be go boom. And I go boom. And then, as I got older and I got set on a system, then pretty soon it's just like, um, well, I'm fine. And then every idea bounced off and I wasn't taking anything away. When in reality, if we're steering a ship towards a goal, you, we ought to leave these conferences not turning 90 degrees, but just saying, what, do I need to adjust my ship a half a degree to the right or to the left? What can I do? Should I increase my speed? Am I going too fast? Maybe I should throttle back a little bit, or maybe it's time to stop and reassess. And so that's kind of what I was hoping, you know, for all of us as we were doing this is that as God grabbed you, you know, what's one gem or two gems that, that stood out to you and how has it affected you as you look back at your church? Hmm. Yeah, that's good. Phil, what was, what was for you um, as you kind of walked through, you know, obviously, you know, we're, we're seasoned leaders and you guys are John and, and Phil, not saying that you're old, but you know, you're, you're older than some of us. Um, <laughs> but um, with everything that you've been, been through and trained in and multiple conferences and all sorts of things, what were, what were some of the key takeaways for you? The, um, the session on Tuesday that I led the, the talking about hospitality was somewhat biographical. It's hard to preach and not preach to yourself. Amen. And um, I think I'm making time. And I know that like for Spark and I, the way we developed and kind of developed leadership between us, I mean, it was every Monday, generally for 10 years, having breakfast. You, you have to make room in your life to, to develop leaders. And uh, Spark and I are able to enjoy the relationship we have because we invested in it over a long time. And so I was kind of challenging myself because I'm limited in my time with my church quarter time. And I'm also limited with how much time I put into guys and how I do that. So I was preaching to myself. Uh, it was during the session while I was talking about Psalm 110 that it hit me. Jesus might have been thinking of Psalm 110 when he said Luke 10 too. Pray for laborers from the harvest. Well, God's people, free will offerings. That's Psalm 110. And I hadn't thought about that. It just sort of came to me while I was talking. And I've been chewing on that since then. Um, the uh, thing from Josh that was really good for me was the challenge for prayer and fasting. And uh, we'd already felt a prompting. Um, David Sosa, my associate, and I at our church, we'd already felt a prompting to really put an emphasis on prayer. We've already talked with uh, Har Harvest Prayer Ministry. We're not going to bring them in, but I I've already read two books from them. And so since, uh, since Think Next, I did also read uh, David Roadcup has a book out on, uh, it's, it's on Kindle for like four bucks on prayer and fasting. And I read that yesterday, actually. It's not a long one, maybe 70 pages. 
and uh, and and I'm trying to think through how to um, engage the congregation more in a active, gen genuine. Let's let's just turn to the Lord and pray. Now with Mac, uh, <laughs> I don't know if you knew this, Andrew. I would say I went through a relapse rehab experience with Mac. Um, you got to understand, I have a master's degree that I got years ago in church growth. And so techniques for growing churches, methodologies for growing churches. And, um, and as much as they would always start the classes and workshops with, hey, it's Jesus who grows the church, they would immediately switch to a mode of, if you just do this, 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 and this, you'll get this as a result. So if you're not getting that result, you're screwing up, idiot. And, um, and it took only about 15 minutes for me to start all of a sudden having an internal meltdown. <laughs> and it happened over several days. It took um, uh, the following Monday, it was really bad. The following Tuesday, John and I had one of our calls. We talk at least twice a month. And again, hospitality, you got to make time for people who are going to um, speak into your life. And uh, by Tuesday, I was starting to recover and realize that that's not Mac. Mac didn't say what I was hearing, but that's what I was hearing. I was beating the hell out of myself for being the crappiest visionary I've ever met, for not having a vision for the church, not having a vision for Nexus. And um, and I, I needed to just calm down and realize I'm talking to myself and lying to myself. Okay, talk to myself and speak truth. John helped me do that. And then re-engaging Mac because there's still there's some things I can do better, but but I have to come at it and just it's like he didn't realize and I didn't even think about it, but I came to think next and I was like an alcoholic and I just had somebody hand me a Long Island iced tea and it took me off the deep end. <laughs> and uh, and I went for years at one stretch in my ministry, I went for probably three years where I didn't read a single pragmatic thing. I read Eugene Peterson, Dallas Willard, Richard Foster, all kinds of stuff, but I would not let myself read stuff that was pragmatic. So Mac was a, I mean, that was like pragmatism on steroids and it was really good stuff, but it just, it was like, like I said, it was like four or five Long Island iced teas for me. It was just, it, it put me in the tank. I'm coming back. I'm fine. Uh, I had to, I had to reinterpret. So I'm, I'm still coming up, but we've done things. We've already built an internship plan around one of Max guides uh, we, um, I did put more time over the last week into doing some vision stuff, God dream stuff for a nexus. And of course, Andrew and Spark helped prompt that, but I poured a lot of time into that, that I probably wouldn't have had Mac not prompted me to. And, um, um, anyway, there's other things that are going on, but that's, that's what happened to me. And, um, yeah, no, that was good. I'd like to um, maybe just kind of follow through with a, a couple of just different sessions in turn. And, uh, you know, because we started out session one on that Tuesday afternoon with um, with Phil just sharing with us just the, the, the need for sufficient sp spirituality, developing the leader within you, um, all, all these different aspects of what that looks like. And then even session two where um, Mac first session on Wednesday morning was all about leading self. Um, one of the things that you said, Phil, of just like one of the most important things that we can do for our churches is to raise the bar of leadership by raising the bar of our own leadership and, um, and just being able to do some of those things. So um, I'd love to, cause Phil, I know you read like everything under the sun. Um, like, I, I don't know how you get work done because you read everything all the time. <laughs> I get everything done through you guys. <laughs> But um, but not as a, an offensive. I just like I'm jealous that you get to read like all the time. Um, but um, for for everybody else, like maybe on the call, what are what are some of those things that maybe even came out of this session, um, or or even John, like you even mentioned that you you appreciated how how Mac talked about certain ideas because you thought that Ralph um really did that as well of just like blitzing one topic or different things like that. Mac talked about you know kind of our, our dispersed focus versus like a deliberate focus rather than reading a bunch of things or listening to a bunch of different topics and stuff like that versus just picking one thing and just like just going to town on that one um what do, what do you do in that regard or or is that beneficial for you personally well um i'll get let me um i do it's called um i, I was when when i began the ministry in the um in the 80s i um the first book I read as a disciple on his staff was In Search of Excellence by Tom Peters. 
and um, which is, um, you know, that's a secular book. And Ralph, Ralph's thrust for me and teaching me apologetics at an early age was that don't be afraid of anything, but just, but underlying whatever you take from whatever you read, you, you need to find um, the biblical precedent for it. And so it, it, it's rooted, whatever, whatever idea you have, if it's not rooted in the scripture, don't do it. And so we read everything. And, and, and so one of the concepts we learned from Tom Peters was chunking where you, you know, it was, we, we weren't dispersed in what we did. And that, that was a good thing. Cause um, Matt kind of gave me permission to be even more laser beam focused on some things. And so, um, and, and so um, young leaders, um, I, I tended to read five or six books at a time. And, and then um, what Ralph taught me is just read one and permission not to read the whole thing. But as soon as you get one or two big takeaways from the book, put it down. There's, there's, there's this thing, no, I got to finish it to the end. No, you got what the Holy Spirit wanted you to get now and now meditate on it. And then in the next seven days, the challenge was, cause I was also in a search of um, a seven habits kid in the eighties as well. Try to do something within seven days based on what you learned. And then um, the second part of that, not only try to do something in seven days, but try to talk to someone else about it within the next seven days. And so so I left the conference and right away, because I have a, um, you know, Phil and I meet, you know, um, I, I strategically uh, in my life, um, I have at least four meetings a week where people speak into my life. So it's not like um, I'm, I'm ministering, you know, it's I'm meeting with peers that we interact with one another like this. And, um, and so I wanted to kind of pause there, if you don't mind, Andrew, and I really want to hear from you all in here. It's just like, what is your one grab that you got out of it? You know, and if, if we wouldn't mind just kind of going around, I just want to hear, you know, it's been three weeks is, you know, or um, what was one thing, your big takeaway or something that you kind of just are thinking about since that time. And Caleb, if uh, your one grab is that you're working for such a loser, you know, Patrick, uh, feel free to say that this is a safe space. We won't let Patrick know that that was said. It is recorded. It is recorded. Let me let me pause it real quick. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll start. If uh, my one thing that I took away from it was um, just being intentional, um, in in training leaders, I think um, we over the last year and a half. I've been really intentional about building disciples. Um, and although dis discipleship can lead into leadership and leadership training, I see those things as different. And so um, how can we take what we've learned about growing disciples and, and training disciples? How can we bring that intentionality into another side of what we do or what we need to be doing is, is growing leaders within the church. And so um, my, my, as I've sat here for the last three weeks, thinking about it, I, I got both his books, the, the growth workbook. Um, Cause I wanted to thumb through it. He gave us a lot of stuff and I wanted to thumb through it and see what we could use, what we, what we would want to do ourselves and that kind of deal. And we offer discipleship training once a quarter. And so alongside of that, we would offer leadership training as well. Um, and it would be just something that's on the, on the calendar all the time, be just being intentional about always offering leadership training for those who want to, what was it, what does it mean to be a leader at Traverse? What's it mean to be a leader? And then in, and in, in through that, um, help us to better understand um, those, those leaders who we can give more to um, those who we could start at the bottom and grow up, because um, I really enjoyed his, his it, it seemed like he was making a, uh, a pyramid scheme for the church leadership, which isn't a bad thing, but uh, <laughs> that's what, in my mind, that's what I saw was a, you know, you have this guy at the top, and then you, you start training leaders, and then you got two people, and then from there, you go, you, go, you get more people, so um, instead of going from the top, down it's more he was starting at the bottom going up um but yeah i all that to say intentionality in what we're doing as a church the same way we've been doing discipleship training bring that into leadership training um 
And there's already people in my mind that as soon as we start this, I'm going to ask to be a part of it um, because I start, I've already started thinking about people who, um, you know, they may be a little bit later in life right now, but I think if they would have been, had the opportunity to, to plant a church earlier in life, they'd be great at it. Um, and I just don't think the church has done a really good job of internally um, focusing and, and zeroing in on those people. And so I think that will help us. Good. <clears throat> Who's next? I'll go. Uh, this, this is go Errol. And uh, I've been out of church planting uh, activities basically for five years. So I come back home to New Mexico and I have the opportunity to work with the organization that I worked with before but not as the executive director. So one was, my first takeaway was, my heart is really in church planning. That's really where I wanna be and what I get to do. So that's the biggest takeaway from it for me. Right on Earl. Um, go ahead, Ruth. You, Ruth, you're gonna share something, go ahead. Uh, I have a lot of, small different thing, not one huge thing, I guess. But um, I guess one thing that came to my mind is I feel like our church is quite healthy in a lot of ways, but just the idea to pray for people to come. I feel like we have a lot of good structures and systems and people who are spiritually healthy. Um, and in a way, what I felt like is, well, I'm a runner. And um, I ran my fastest mile ever at the state track meet my senior year of high school. And I know I did it because I was running with people who were as fast as me or a little faster. And that's how I really felt at Whitewater. Um, but I, I confess, I don't really pray a lot for just God to bring people to us. We've, we've done a lot of things through our God dreams committee to try to promote our church in our community and and I know that was during a really weird time of COVID but man I don't think any of that stuff brought anyone through our doors honestly maybe a couple but but not many um so just to realize like well maybe you should just start with with something that's simple and obvious which is praying um I think in terms of leading ourselves our little elder team of four of us, um, we just started reading and kind of made a reading plan to read through the book called The Emotionally Healthy Church by, I think, Peter Scazzaro. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we talked about that at our elder meeting Tuesday, and we're going to kind of read it over the course of three elder meetings over about a month and a half. And I really like that we're um, reading a book like that as a, a leadership team um, to point out any internal flaws that we're, we're needing to deal with that could be inhibiting our, our church as a whole. Um, I also think that um, my colleagues on our elder board who are all church staff, you know, I think they did feel well as Adam <laughs> That during a sermon, he said he felt like he was being kicked in the balls for six hours the day that Mac Lakes Mac Lake spoke. Um, but I think that although we're kind of non-traditional folks, we already are doing a lot of those things. And I think it just took us some conversations and a little um, self-reflection to realize we are doing a lot of those things. Are you guys familiar with our life transformation groups that we have through our church? No. Does anybody else? Okay, I'll explain it. Um, I know we paid somebody for brochures that are copyrighted, but basically an LTG is like two people of the same gender um, meet, committing to meeting together once a week for I think about one hour. And there's kind of like three purposes. I'm I'm on the spot, so I'm not going to probably get it right, but you commit to reading a certain amount of scripture each week, 
to praying for each other and for others who are unsaved who are in our lives. And then there's the set of kind of like accountability questions. But what's really neat is the idea is, um, you know, it's pretty easy to have commitment to a small group of people, two or three. Um, you know, when you have 15 people and you're trying to schedule something, it's more challenging. But the idea is that, you know, two people meet, maybe they invite a third person to join them and maybe a fourth person expressed an interest. Um, and then you split into two groups of two. So it's, it's a very much multiplication from the bottom level kind of type system. And I, I really like it. And it, it makes you um, be thinking about like, well, maybe Louise and me could bring this other new person in church into our group. Um, and sometimes I, I am finding that it's, it's good to put a lot of thought into who pairs with who, but we do encourage people to find those relationships on their own. Um, I think it is good to be with someone who will be challenging you spiritually um, rather than it being like a mentorship, like new believer, mature believer type thing. Um, and I think also like in relation to the idea of leading leaders, um, I think we've realized that sometimes those LTGs need some leadership too. And um, like we, we had a situation with a group of three people who were meeting and it was just a hot mess. And fortunately they came to the elders and said, hey, we've got these problems in our group and we met and um, kind of had a Matthew 18 meeting, but it was neat to see. Um, well, I, I did say to them like, gosh, we wish you would have talked to us before things got this out of control. Um, yeah, yeah. And then um, I would say another thing for me was simply how we, I realized how little I know about church planning by coming to the Nexus conference. And I asked a lot of questions on the flight and drive home to learn more. And I think that since it's been 13 years since our church was planted, that a lot of people who come to our church don't actually really know much about church planning or the origins of our church. So, um, so I hope that maybe as time passes, maybe I can integrate some of those messages into things I share with the congregation since I'm kind of one of those people who was on the outside who came in and is figuring it out. Cool. Very good, good stuff. How about you, Mike? What was, uh, what was good standouts for you? Um, well, one of the things I grabbed uh, from Phil was just, uh, and, and I know it, but it's just being reminded and focus more on what God's doing inside of you than what he's doing through you, you know, really working on that spiritual growth, spiritual development, which, you know, fed, fed well into the spiritual growth plan, leadership development plan that Mac talked about, you know, and just being more intentional, uh, super easy for me to, to be an intuitive leader. Uh, to be able to just uh, go and do things, but not have a plan for how to teach other people on how to do what it is that I do so that they can do it. And, and uh, so, so being, being able to start inside, um, giving it up versus, uh, you know, having it taken away. I think that's a good nugget too. I, I think that that's something that we did well uh, at, at connection through COVID. Like, we just, we really grasped this idea that, that, yeah, we can have a service, but the church is still going. So let's just continue to, to evolve and, and think outside the box and come up with new ideas. And so we did that well, but I think there's so many other uh, applicable principles for that uh, just in people's lives, because um, you know, we don't like the change that, that tends to cost us. Uh, but if we can sacrifice it, it's, it's definitely uh, a different perspective. Uh, so, and a lot of that was embracing God's greater vision with Josh, uh, and just, just appreciated everything that he had to say for sure. Um, you know, praying big God, God honoring prayers. Um, you know, it's, I think that that's an area where I just struggle with a lot, not just the big God honoring prayers, but just being a person who is dedicated to prayer, like where it's just a rhythm and a habit of life. And, uh, 
some of you guys, if you've been around Nexus, you know that we've got this pray first thing uh, that we strive to do and make it the DNA of the church. And really, it's because I want it to be the DNA of my life. Um, but uh, it's just a, an ongoing battle. So just just having those bigger, bigger things and, uh, you know, just a, a really good question. Does does the church need God uh, being able to to back up and go, wow, are we are we working ahead of of where God wants us. Are we going in, in a wrong direction? And do we really need, uh, need him? Uh, when we first planted the church, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. We needed God to show up. And then, and then you kind of get locked into a rhythm and a routine. And um, pretty soon you're in a position where you need a building. And that building step is a whole lot bigger, I think, than moving to a community and planting a church. It's uh, you know, the financial cost involved with it. And, all the other ramifications as well. Uh, from Mac, um, a, lot, a lot of solid content there. Uh, I've read through the, the Multiplication Effect book. I've got uh, all the other ones sitting here too, just ready to get cracked into. But I think even before I crack into those, it's like for me backing up to chapter 11 and let's go back and, and flush it out. What does this look like in our context? And I've been doing a little bit of that as I've been going along, but uh, really feel like I need like a, I don't know, two week, four week vacation just to kind of set that stuff up. Um, because I've always been a part of smaller churches who didn't have good systems. Uh, everything was just, it's intuitive. It was organic. And most of the time it was horrible. Um, you know, so you learn what not to do. And this is just another one of those nuggets of what to do. And, and at least a system you know, to get into place and to bring proper ministry alignment and developing core competencies for each level and uh, you know, really structuring that pipeline so that you know, you're, you're training in those people and not just, uh, you know, we will do the basic, you know, do it, have them, them see you do it, you know, do it along with them, encourage them to do it, you know, send them to do it and, and follow up. We, we do that, but, you know, just having a, a more developed training module, I think is, is good stuff. So. You know, when people um, talk about us in, in the Hope Chapel thing and, you know, you know, and again, you know, when dinosaurs walked the earth, when we, we started and um, the, the thing that that we learned early was that if you put a book in somebody's hand, uh, it's it's a game changer and it levels the playing field because now you all have the same material. And then if you're consistent, intentional and relational. In, in your meetings at whatever level that you're doing in that. So when we'd come together, I remember days, um, how I learned this was we would all go to Ralph's house and I call it because he asked me, what's the secret to what you did? I said, a living room and a coffee table. And we, we'd have our books and, and Ralph made it clear. He goes, he goes, now, if you don't read, don't come in the house. You got You got to have, you got to be prepared. You, you can't have something that will the spirit of the Lord grab me. And I, I didn't read it, but I prayed. And he goes, well, and so I remember one time, one of our guys um, that um, uh, one of our established leaders, um, and, and again, back then the established leader was like 25 because we were a young church. And this guy named John Haig, he um, showed up and, and I'm walking past the door and he's crying. He's a big man, 6'3", almost Adam size. And he is bawling like a little baby because Ralph won't let him in the house because he didn't read and so ralph's and so he doesn't know what to do and and i just kind of i just said i said go sit in your car and read the stinking book just you know just read it don't don't just read it and i'm this punk 22 year old right and um and we saw that and it kind of stiffened us up and right away we realized that this was valuable and then ralph went on and we um, he talked about 1 Corinthians 14, 26. When you come together, everyone has a psalm of him, a word of instruction. All this, a tongue and something else. All this must be done for the strengthening of the church. And so when, when you put the books in the hands of your people and let up the thing, kind of Robin said that. She was, a, she was the best at running because she was surrounded by really good runners. And what you do is you bring up the, the running capability of your people. I've never read before. Well, time to start you know there's audiobooks there's this kind of stuff that you can do but um you got it you can't come in if you don't read and that's not a punishment it's just because we expect god to speak to you and then 
creating a, an environment like we have here. Well, what's one thing that grabbed you? And then, you know, even as I'm listening, I'm taking notes because it's like, I appreciate you guys being prepared because I learned a couple things. You reminded me, um, Matt, the importance, I mean, Mike, of that um, intuitive is not always reproducible. That was a major takeaway for me. I'm an intuitive leader. I'm a strong personality driven leader, but how do you create a system where it doesn't have to have a, a, a type A super intense personality so that when you leave, did you catch what Max said when he left his church? Church planting left his church too. Mm -hmm. and, and it's like, now we're talking about taking Nexus, adding another dimension, you know, we're fine. I think you guys are like the Navy SEALs of finding a couple, training them and dropping them into a city. I think you guys are the best at it. But now you're talking about what if we develop a farm system within our church so that the 80 plus churches in the network would consider that you're our new pipeline. Can you imagine what, I mean, that's big, big, hairy, audacious prayers for Nexus. Let's do something that we've never done before. You know, again, Robin, you said you were at the church for 13 years, but you're saying, you know, how do we begin to inculcate this, this into our DNA? I don't know what you guys think about that, but that's, that's just what I'm hearing as I'm listening to you guys talk. I have a really practical question. Um, I know I've seen my pastors feel frustrated when they've maybe preached sermons that are focused on a certain book. Um, and I've I I was a public library director previously, and you know, at a public library, if you want people to read books, you give them the books or loan them the books. I'm curious in your congregations. Do you find that your um, church members buy their own books or have you found it worth it to buy multiple copies of something for groups? For the leaders, they buy them. I've had that. For the leaders, we can get them to buy them depending. But mm -hmm. um, if we want the whole congregation to read, we've, we've gone out and bought them. So it does kind of, you don't necessarily buy the most expensive book to do that. Oh, sure. And you yeah. need to buy uh, you have to recognize that people don't, not all readers have the same reading level. Go ahead, John. Well, we, um, it's a, it's, I bring it in as a part, um, um, Ruth of my DNA, right? That, that, that they know that, um, that I'm, I'm always talking about a book. I'm always flashing a title, you know, it's just like, and they're always like, oh, here he goes, another book, another book. But so I'm known to be someone that reads all the time. So in, in my small group, which is most of the, um, I have two groups. I have a Tuesday group and a Wednesday group, both with um, the Tuesday group is intentional leaders that lead other groups. That's the reason why we get together. And that's only twice a month. I, I just do a, you know, a head, heart, hands check on their personal life. And then we, we talk about something we're reading. My, my Wednesday group, it started as a mini church, um, Ruth, where they were, they were, they would, um, share their one big thing from my Sunday message. That's how I started the group, um, three years, almost four years ago. And then one of them said, I heard in your Tuesday group, you guys read books. I said, yeah. And I said, we want to do that. And I said, okay, I recommend. And so everybody bought their own books. We just started from the beginning. So in my group, we're all going to do this. And if you can't afford it, let me know. And so that's how I put it out there. Um, I, we do at least three books a year now in that, in that Wednesday group. We're, the latest one we're reading is where do we go from here? From um, what's that guy, the, the old man, prophecy guy. David Jeremiah. And, um, but we've read um, Neil Anderson. We've read um, um, just before COVID. I felt like the Holy Spirit said, um, let's read The Bait of Satan, which is about being offended. And, and it was amazing how God used it um, in that. Um, and we, we at our other church, what, my other church, when I had it, we, we did a campaign where we decided to do the Purpose Driven Life once. And so what it did is um, I, I made it available to all my leaders, you know, and just said, okay, we're going to, I'm going to teach it on Sunday. And then we're going to talk about it in small groups and make the same offer. You know, it's just, if people can afford it, fine. If not, we'll get it for them. And all we ask is that you read. 
And so I think you come at it from multiple venues of both and, but um, whatever you feel like it works. Um, sometimes buying books for your leaders is a reward. Wow, my church cares about me. They got me this, they, they got me the tools. And that says a lot. Hey, here's something, you know, we got this for you. You're on our team. Or it even um, um, promote somebody. Yeah, we gave, it, word gets out, we gave book to leaders. And then three people that don't think they're leaders, you, you gave them books and they go, wow, I guess yeah. I'm a leader. And that's kind of cool because now you're affirming something with a value that you do. What are you thinking, Ruth, when you hear that? What's going through, what's going through your brain? I think it's all making sense. I'm taking some notes. Um, yeah. Um, I feel like maybe our church has been a little hesitant to buy books for people who aren't leaders, but yeah, I do think it's a good way to feel invested in. Yeah. And you know what? And you, you may pick someone who's not, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just like, the, I think the, the grace and mercy of Jesus is wonderful. If anything, you've got a well-equipped servant, <laughs> you know, it's like, or that feels affirmed. And, and, and like, even when you read these books, they talk about, uh, as, as I'm reading training for, um, trainers, you know, that, that book that, um, that Josh recommended, they talk about their failure rate in it too, that not everybody grabs it. Not everybody does this stuff, but you know, that's why they throw it out to everybody. So that was, that was pretty interesting. Yeah. I think it depends there. on the person even. Um, we've got a couple guys on our team that you know, I'll buy books and say, hey, you know, I really enjoyed this book. You guys give it a read and they'll, oh, I already got that. Um, you know, they, they've heard about it someplace and, um, you know, that's great. And I've got other guys too, like it doesn't matter if you buy them a book or not, like trying to get them to read is, is a really difficult thing unless you're going through together. Yes. Um, you know, if, if we uh, if we do something, uh, which we have done uh, a couple different ones, Dangerous Prayers uh, by Groeschel. We did that as a church, you know, as a sermon series. And then, you know, what we did was just buy a bunch of copies and had them available in the back. I mean, the people still had to purchase them, but we didn't let money be an issue. Like if it's an issue, like just tell us, we'll make sure you get one. Yeah, because you're talking about intentionality, Mike, right? And I think that, again, um, you, if we're up in the game and, and we're, we're, we're talking about, you know, transitioning from just making disciples, to making leaders, then again, we, we want to up the ante on what the end product is. You know, we don't have a spirit of fear and timidity, but a power and love and, and discipline. So we have the goods in us to, to be. And the whole thing about it is, is we're transformed because we leave this thing and go, wow, that's a gem of an idea. So you first inculcate the discipline into yourself and then you find a couple others say, hey, you want to do this with me? You know, let's let's try this, and um, it's amazing. We have a we have a group of guys that uh, one of our groups is a bunch of guys that get out of prison, and um, the guy that leads it, he says, "I'm going to get him to read a book," and uh, one of the guys, the other leader in the group, says, "Good luck, man." He goes, "I don't think you can even read a chewing gum label." You know, he's just being really sarcastic, and and my my guy goes, he goes, he goes, John, you know what? He goes, I think these guys would be blown away if we bought everybody a book. So we did. And those guys read, you know, because they were so grateful coming out of prison that all of a sudden they have a group and that they're valued. And then it's just like, so they were given one of our leadership books. I considered leadership book at, at Journey and they finished it, you know, and, and the fruit of it is, is that, you know, while I'm big on farm systems on the inside, if you start getting groups that you up the ante in them, watch what they do. And then little things like, hey, find somebody that in the next seven days, just tell one person what you learned. Or, hey, I'm reading this thing. This is what God showed me. And then you give them a, the means to go out there. And the guys that are going to lead groups, so you're going to watch. They can't just talk to one person. They talk to multiple people. And all of a sudden, if you're patient, you begin to see stuff that kind of shifts in your culture as you're giving them tools and permission to go out there. But not just with, it's their story for one thing, but now it's stuff that they learned. Right. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's it's just um, it's just been fun to watch what God brings out as people, because, you know, Jesus said greater things than these and your people in your church. They are great. They are great people. I was pointing out Spark didn't get a chance to share what he maybe picked up and neither did Andrew necessarily. I wasn't sure. Yeah, go ahead, Spark. What do you got? 
make sure he was paying attention. Yeah, Spark. Think about your Come granddaughter. On, Think about your well, granddaughter there. Tuesday, Tuesday uh, with you, I was in and out of making sure the team was ready to rock and roll and get coffee and stuff, but um, really convicted about prayer and fasting because Phil, you and I used to do that monthly. We would, we would intentionally put on the calendar a day of prayer and fasting and not do anything but that. And I have been wanting to get back to that. I used to do prayer walks and, you know, there was some major stuff that God poured into me when I finally just silenced myself and, you know, it wasn't a bunch of shooting up, but it was receiving. And so um, with Matt, just my mind being the structure guy that I kind of am, just seeing what you said, John, of a farming system from the 80 churches and really supporting some structure around that to help our guys start identifying potential church planters early, you know, and, and then supporting them in the process to help them kind of go up the pipeline, if you will, yeah. and send them out. Cause I'm one of those guys, by the way, <laughs> long time ago, but I'm one of those guys. Um, and then John, I'm telling you, when you said God moved the river, that was huge. That was just huge. I actually went back. I'm, I'm, I was in a ministry called Love in the Name of Christ, and I'm back kind of on some board committees and stuff with them because I just love that ministry, right? And I went and I told them, I said, you know, we're talking about planning. They're looking at Andrew to help long-term planning stuff. And I said, we have to realize that God moved the river. I said, and I quoted you, but that was huge. And then uh, Josh saying, lay your yes on the table. I can't even believe the number of times I've used that. You got to just lay it all down and lay your yes on the table. So those are kind of my big, big chunks. I'm still chewing on a lot of it, but the prayer and fasting thing is really starting to kick my butt actually so i'll send you my notes from the book i read yesterday okay yeah because yeah. i'm a terrible reader by the way <laughs> i'm working on it but i'm 65 and i'm like you know what lord so i, I may try uh audio books there you go there you go it pulls me away the book i read yesterday it's not a big one <laughs> i know that's that's phil i do read fast yeah, I, Right now, I am just soaking up podcasts. Take there's some <laughs> there's some secular ones that are awesome. Uh, Alex Lieberman, uh, Founders Journal. He started Morning Brew with a co-founder. He's awesome. He's got a couple things that I really follow. But I'm starting to have to go back and listen and take notes now because I'm just learning that way. But it's good stuff. Anyway, that's me. That's what I got. Awesome. What about you, Andrew? Stuff, man. Yeah, and no, I, I mean, I always really appreciate just the uh, the leading self aspect. So with um, with what Phil said and um, stuff that Mac was talking about uh, initially of, of leading self and just being able to, you know, just be mindful of, uh, gosh, there's another quote that Phil kind of mentioned, um, you know, just the idea that it's, it's possible for you to be a very effective pastor and lose your soul in the process. And one of the things that I've been trying to be mindful of lately is, um, training people out of experience rather than just theory. Um, because I have a lot of great training and a lot of different aspects of what that looks like, but just trying to be, you know, when I'm training individuals to, um, cast vision for their own life. Like I need to be a leader that's, that's doing that personally when I'm part of a organization trying to lead other organizations to, to lead well, like we need to be doing that personally. And, um, when I'm talking about discipleship and sharing the gospel, like I need to be doing that personally. And, um, rather than just like, Oh, like here's, here's all these tools that I've been trained in by all these effective leaders, but just having the, the ownership and the growth and the personal uh, relationship with the Lord myself in that, um, 
that was that was really good. A couple of quotes that really stuck out to me from Mac Lake. Um, I'm not a dictator of what you do. I'm a steward of who you are. Um, when he was talking about leading yeah. leading other people, and um, you know, rather than another another one of the things that he kind of talked about of just like pulling somebody out and just like filling a, a role like a volunteer role, like he said, no, that's leader placement. That's not that's not leader development. And there's a huge difference. Um, and just being able to recognize some of these things that we that we've always seen is like, well, this is yeah, we've got leaders and we're raising up leaders just because we have all the volunteer holes filled may not mean that we're actually doing what 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 God's called us to do. And so um, just running the machine rather than rather than truly investing in people. Um, the the other aspect of it is just um, and and this has honestly been kind of ingrained in me since we first got involved with Nexus and I first got even introduced to the vision frame of what is mission, what is vision, what are values, how do you define that? Um, Mac Lake talked a lot about just defining your terms, like what is a leader? What is leadership development? You know, from the Bonhoeffer process, like what is a disciple? What is the gospel? Like we all these terms, these major ideas that we keep just throwing out and assuming that we that we know and maybe like Mike was saying, like just intuitively, we we've always just learned about and known and done. Like we just need to step back for a minute and just say like, okay, when I say this, what am I actually, what am I actually doing? What am I believing? Uh, what is all being assumed whenever I'm delivering some of this content? Like what is, what is a leader? Like, Hey, we need to develop leaders. Well, okay. Just simple terms. Like let's define what a leader is. And then when he was talking about just the, the leadership pipeline, all the different levels and the things that we call people, like whether it's coach or pastor or leader or trainer or director or or whatever, like use the same terminology. If you're, if you're, you know, totally scattered and you're at the same level of the pipeline and like five different ministries are using different words for the same type of person, like it just gets jumbled and confused. Like, just, so just being clear on how we define what it is that we're saying and what it is that we're teaching people, um, whether it's from mission and vision to what, what the gospel is to what leaders are, um, that's, that was just a kind of a reaffirmation rather than, you know, just something brand new to learn about. But, but that was good. And then Josh Howard stuff is always fantastic, man. That was, that was great. I loved his, uh, brutal facts exercise. Yeah. Um, that was, <laughs> that was very challenging. Yeah. Um, along with everything else about, about prayer and fasting and uh, all the things, man, that was, that was good stuff. Two things stand out for me. I'll throw out too. Um, Taking the time to go through your notes. Um, my own personal experience, if I go to something like this and I don't go back and review the notes, it just disappears, which is why the phone call like this is vital. But, you know, still even schedule another time to do it. Um, and then make time. Um, you know, if you're in ministry, you know, Mike, I don't know how long it takes you to write a sermon, but you can, you can figure out a way to save yourself a couple hours to just go sit and be quiet. Mm -hmm. I ended up preaching a sermon on Sunday with 15 minutes notice, uh, you know, cause David wasn't feeling well and he thought he could preach. And I'm like, we are not putting you up sounding like that and coughing and spewing on people with COVID still in the background. So no, you're sitting down till next week and I guess I'm preaching. And um, it was just a reminder to me that um, we've always got the time. We control our time. Our congregations don't have a clue what we do for a living. So, you know, <laughs> we used to take uh, that day of prayer and fasting, we would go to the boat dock and just sit on that boat dock and, and just journal. We found time for it. You know, and I, I think another thought, John, you, you kind of inspired me. You always got, you got in search of excellence. I read this book, The Balancing Act. Yeah. Bob Wren, Spark, made me get this in 1998. And it coached me through reading it. And I went back to it because I was looking for what's a book that's addressing the issue of um, how, do, how do I cast vision for all the stakeholders and how do I even interpret and uh, understand what is, my, what is our vision, how are we doing it, as well as what's our context, what's really going on. And this book did it, and I just pulled it off the shelf. And there's, you know, you got great books like Eugene Peterson's Leap Over a Wall. That's a, that's a you know, I want to read that again before I die. You know, that whole idea, Andrew, of uh, Saul being ruined as a God-appointed leader, 
by uh, God anointed leader by doing his God appointed task. The task took him down. He was good at it. That was the problem. <laughs> so anyway, I'd say go back and reread books that already impacted you because at a certain point, I don't know when the point comes, you need to quit reading new books. You need to go back and read the ones that really were highly influential in your life because there's probably more there that you didn't get. Amen. And let me hitchhike off of that. You know, um, Phil and I, he, 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 he's too kind talking about how he and I, the process, and it sounds like I talked him off a ledge. We regularly talk each other off the ledge at least once a month. And it's okay. Are you, I'm, I'm jumping. You know, okay, Phil, get me off the ledge, get me off the stinking ledge. And you know, one of the things that I struggled with, I'll be real frank with you in the midst of all the things is I was, you know, I'm listening to Josh and I did the numbers thing. Remember he had us do the whole stats, the 90% and how many churches, and then, you know, you know, they're doing it with one hand on the wheel and the Holy Spirit filling you. And, you know, there are 5 billion people get saved in, in two minutes. And so it's like, I'm sitting there and going, I, I, why am I even doing this? You know, so I, I felt like and, and then at first I thought I'm in the wrong job, you know, and it's just so I felt that that I rebuked that because I know I'm in the right job. And then all of a sudden I started looking at, you know what, maybe I can up the pace at journey. I seriously, I started thinking, how do I up the pace of journey to do this? And, and, and I went through this and Phil and I, and a couple of my other friends that I, like I said, I have people that, that are smarter than me that I meet with every week. Cause I need people that just say, what, what the hell are you talking about? And I, a couple of weeks ago, the Lord gave me Psalm 37, you know, and I shared this with Phil, Psalm 37, 34 in the midst of all of this. Cause I'm going, okay, I'm going to up the pace. We're going to do this thing. I'm going to pour gas on our farm system at Journey. We're going, to, we're going to do this, you know. And then Psalm 37, 34 says this, hope in the Lord and keep his way. And basically, I felt like the Lord said, hope in the Lord and stick to the plan. Because <laughs> I, I pray, I have a, I have a long-term vision plan, 25 years. I have, um, I have a, a goals for this year. I, I do quarterly things that I do, and I've been doing this for years. But all of a sudden, I go to the conference, and now I'm going to turn the aircraft carrier 180 degrees, and plus go to Mach 12 because of this. And so I really stopped, and I had the process with some people, and even challenge what we heard. And, I, and I'm going to throw you a bomb in this. I challenge even what Josh said because I wanted to talk to some of my friends. Is it, why, why is it that all these places do this stuff, but in America we're stunted? And I went to two guys that I trust. And here's what my Chinese friend, long-term st strategic planner, church planner said. He goes, he goes, well, the Asian cultures have something on the American cultures. It's easy. Number one, they have poverty. So they're on their face and they, they just hunger for God more than we do. He goes, number two, in Asian culture, they, they have a family structure that is a lot more sound than the American family, which is fractured. And so the thing is, is that, and then, and then the thing is, so once they have something, the head of the household will get something and the, the rest of the household is likely to fall in line with it. Now it's sincere in what's going on, but I started talking about, thinking about this because and then my friend said, there's a third thing with the American church, and we, we have to hold this with kid gloves, is that, but we model the American church, we're an orphanage with a one father on the top. And we invite everybody to come in and say, this is your family, and they look at a crowd. Versus in the Asian model, this is their family, and they fit in the living room, the house church. So... My friend said, you know what, John, you do need to slow down because we do need to, we, people need repair. They need places of safety, you know, that where they can begin to do this. You can do this exponentially, but don't leave out the intimacy that fractured people need. And so again, talking to people that are smarter than us, people that know you long enough. And again, and, and if after all that, you feel like the Holy Spirit saying, no, you know what, let's go to Mach 12, then do it. But um that's that's the strength that I have when I when I put books in other people's hands, when I begin to have regular meetings with people that that are doing the same thing. That's why, you know, my heart is, you know, as I look at you guys, there's there's gems of relationships that you have with people. But when you read a book, you're adding a personality into the conversation. You know, it's just like, you, you, you know, one of my one of my mentors that took care of me, Jack Hayford, over the years, I, I, I've had meetings with him rarely, but I 
he's in a lot of my conversations because I read a book with him. So I don't know, just, just food for thought when it comes to, you know, just um, as we're doing this, there's things you want to do, but you know, it's, and I'm hitchhiking off what Andrew said, you know, you know, are you on mission? Do you have a set of values? Do you have a plan? Then take all this stuff and saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? Is it a major turn or is it a little adjustment? Is it up speed? Or is it less speed? Do I come to a halt? Does that make sense? I get really excited after I hear Josh and then I come back to my little neck of the woods and the church that I'm a member of. And the, what I see happening is it's baby steps, right? Because the attractional model is so ingrained in what they were doing. I just had lunch with our director of men's groups and He's like, Spark, I want to learn more about this multiplying discipleship stuff. I says, I can help you with that. So. Yeah, the thing, the thing that I appreciate about um, what, what Josh says is, is oftentimes that he's like, well, we'll train anything that moves, <laughs> you know, and so that they're, that they're constantly invested. And then I asked him like a year ago when, you know, this was before his you know, 2021 numbers came out. I think it was when the 2020 numbers came out that they were just starting to blow up. And he's like, you know, we've planted X amount of churches just in 2020, more than what we've done in the previous like nine years combined is what it sounded like. And I was like, well, what do you, what do you attribute that growth to? And his primary focus was investing in leadership development. Like we, we are doing that more than we ever have been before in training and, and emphasizing some of that stuff. So um, the other biggie that Josh shared that I took away was don't assume who your God's chosen leader is. When he talked about those 12, right. And the yeah. 11 never did the work. And the guy that he would never pick is Amen. really the one Amen. that was the seed to start the whole thing going. Yeah. I think Bill Hull has a quote in his uh, conversion and discipleship book from one of the uh, uh, Bonhoeffer readings that um, talks about the the church that you desire is always at odds with like the church that you have and the church that you dream of having someday um, that, that we need to like forget about some of that stuff and just like kind of just disciple who's in front of you, like whatever's whatever's there. And, you know, there are a lot of guys talk about some of that type of stuff. Yeah. So. Yeah, Bonhoeffer's quote is, is he who has the ideal picture of community is the enemy of community. Because the community that exists is what you feel like you have to kill to get what you want. Right. And, Interesting. Uh, yeah. Good job, John. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, John. Our crew had to run. We'll, we'll, we'll work on um, d doing these follow-up calls. I think it's vital. Let's, let's go ahead and promote it again. And But... Uh, I, I certainly value your your feedback, and yes, you did too. Talk me off the ledge. <laughs> I think you know. I think the my thing quick solution you, is always I quit. I'm going to go start something new. Yeah, yeah. It's just like I'm going to start a worm farm. I'm going to start a worm farm in my backyard. But I think that you know the thing that um, I appreciate. You know that you know being a part of what you're doing, and like I said, I I, I feel like I've, I've been adopted into your family, and I and I and and. And I think for such a time as this, when we, when, cause um, when you guys are talking about, you know, we, we hear a guy like Mac Lake and then we're talking about farm systems and the pipeline, cause I couldn't stop thinking about the potential of the, the, the men and women in the room. If they begin to buy into, you can create localized farm systems yep. and, and just imagine, you know, just because now the vetting process even that much more, cause it's like, well, I don't know him, but I, but I know Adam. And, and Adam, he swears by this guy. So all of a sudden the guy gets moved to the front of the line because it's just like, he's been, he's been mentored and trained in a, in a system with a, with a bunch of leaders that you trust and a church organization that you trust. And then all of a sudden you've got this rich pipeline and, um, and the potential to, to, you know, when, um, what was it? Josh talked about, was it Josh or Mac at the end? They, they sit, they, they made the, um, it looked like the tic-tac-toe diagram and beginning to do that, you know, inviting churches to tic-tac-toe right around their church. Yes. And, and then all of a sudden now we're looking at potential with the idea, with the, the T4T model, 
that all of a sudden we start with just, well, you know, what's the possibility of launching a small group right there? What can we do? Okay, and then we, we kind of hybrid the models together over time and we see what happens and just throw it out, throw it out. But I think the potential in the next five years is pretty awesome. Keep that thought because we just laid out what one of our goals was. And um, just a second, I'm looking for it. What's our, um, what would it look like for us to put together sort of a specialized game plan, an actual game plan for a training school or offer a Nexus certificate? What would be the scope and sequence for emerging leaders who are growing up in our churches? We got Frank Mack is hip planting a church with Brad Hooley, who was at the training when you did a Think Next with us. A young couple sat on the front row. It's been three and a half years. They're ready. They're launching now. Wow. But but we kind of just made up something with him. What what is it we should do that would you know we're, we're not going to be too rigid. But if uh, Danny Salazar is with Mike Mosier, who was just on the um, uh, phone on the call with us, Danny came to Think Next. They're wanting him to plant a church. So so what do we put him into? And, and we, we don't have to make it all up. We can just basically say, go get this class at this place, go go attend this seminar here. I mean, we can, we can, but but what would it be? So, exactly. uh, and you guys at uh, Hope Chapel, that's what you did. You sent people out. Now, I don't think you really trained. Or no, we out. were, no, we didn't. And I think that's the thing. We, um, we, the, the first generation went out because I think the, the health of the, the mother church, the farm system was in place, but um, but some of our churches, it was more hit and miss when they, they created their own farm systems. They would get their guys together, but they kind of lost sight of the value package of, of what we're doing. Um, yeah, well, the, the was, values weren't transmitted. No, no. So I, when I left, we recreated the culture. And so we were able to plan a whole bunch of churches. And then, um, and then I had a couple guys that um, some of them caught it maybe a little better. But again, my conviction was, again, charismatic leader, uh, more intuitive than systems oriented. That's why, you know, over time I've created, you know, the coconut tree and all the different things and looked at the systems that we have. And then, and, and so that's helping us at this level. So what we've learned yeah. during COVID is that we, it's easily transmittable on the small group level. And then one of our groups has caught fire that they, they've got three generations now. Okay. But, um, but they're still, it's, it's more caught versus taught. So our system has to get better in teaching what Josh was talking about, the four generational model, the T4T. Yeah. So I got to tweak ours a little more. We're dealing with it too. And um, we just did our God dreams or at least an uh, update. And I don't know guys, if I stated that right, that's how I, that's how I wrote notes. But uh, one of our four things we want to really nail down and get done by the end of the year would be that the next time Mike Mosier says, I got a guy in my church who might want to plant a church someday. We've got a game plan. Yeah. We've got a menu set up here. Start here. Oh, I've already done it. Perfect. <laughs> Move to the next item. Yeah. We don't have that. Yeah. So we're going we're gonna to create it. Well, good to All see right. you guys. Thanks. Thanks for playing. All right. Thanks God bless. Talk to you later. All right, guys. All right. Bye now.